AI is challenging the assumption of the way product managers think. And we're in conversation today with Danny, who's going to help us unpack that. AI. 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 Hi, um, I'm Danny. I'm a product leader. Um, I, I started my career off as a, you know, individual contributor, product manager, what people classically think of as product management, I think, you know, single, lean, agile team, you know, embedding user-centered design principles, um, in simple terms, you know, building an app for external customers. Um, yeah. But, you know, what I really do and specialize in now is, is product leadership, um, product strategy, and especially the use of data and AI to solve the, like the big systemic problems that organizations have and want to solve for. Probably the most influential person um, in contemporary product management is Marty Kagan. Um, Marty Kagan has written uh, a few books, um, inspired, transformed. They're, they're thought of by a lot of product managers as a bit of a Bible. Um, he, Marty leads Silicon Valley Product Group. And I went to a talk of his the other day and he, he made an observation about AI that I think is true for product management, but also just product development and software development in general, which was if you're using AI to just make what you already do easier and faster, you're kind of doing it wrong. So if you're just using AI to yeah. enhance your current processes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you mind just breaking down like why in your view? Well, I suppose why you think that's why that's the case and what people should be doing to look at it slightly differently. If you contrast a couple of, of extremes and probably the reality sits somewhere in the middle of these, you know, you as a user of an, an LLM, you can absolutely use it to help you write backlog stories. You can absolutely use it to help you with um, research synthesis and transcripts. The way that AI is changing how software is built represents a much more fundamental change than that. I'm a really intensive user of Claude Code myself, yeah. and I use it daily. And the way that I use it, I think, suggests a different approach to some aspects of product management and a different approach to software. And in simple terms, when I don't think we're just dealing with teams of people anymore. Mm. We're also dealing with machines. And agentic coding tools are not perfect, and they make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And there are many instances where you might not want to write production code with them. And the split between what's AI generated and, and human generated depends on what you're trying to do. But there's so many areas where they excel that often the pace with which code can get written, and especially prototypes and MVPs can be built, means that some of the conventions in terms of how as a product manager you work with an interface with a team are different. Now, the kind of established cadence is, you know, there's discovery that leads a bit ahead of, of development and you prototype and you validate ideas and you break things down into epics and stories aligning with a goal. There's so many, so many stories you can write yeah. for a one week iteration or two week iteration period. When the pace that software can be built is faster than the pace with which you can churn out requirements, it starts to question how you should think about requirements. And there's a term that's emerged that I didn't come up with, I wish I had, but a term that's emerged called specification driven development. And essentially it's the idea that you spend much more time in the planning stage and the specification stage than you necessarily do in execution. And I think for a lot of people, this is counterintuitive. Most people working in tech now grew up in the agile age mm. and anything that sounds close to waterfall is a dirty word. And I'm not suggesting that we return to the days of like these huge, you know, rigid, cycles before anything can be tested writing you know human crafted pseudo code in documents but essentially you want requirements that are both human readable and machine readable mm. and adapt to the pace with which things can happen and i think it just fundamentally changes the interaction between a product manager and a team 
And Core Code is a really good example of this. So Core Code really likes markdown documents. Mm. Core Code really likes to put plans together. At least that's how you should be using it if you want an effective result. I think it's really important to remember why you work in the way that you work and what problem it's there to solve. And the reason that in the past we were so tight on not doing too much, not having too many requirements, really focusing, was because the most expensive resource in the team was development and yeah. developer time. And that's just changing. If I can create a live data prototype in a week mm. and it's not right, I can create another live data prototype in a week or in a few days and it might not be right. But the amount of work I can do in an iteration cycle is just ever increasing. So I think as product managers, software developers, AI engineers, anyone who's you know, thinking about building technology, you just have to kind of step back and think, are we still solving the right problem? So the whole software development lifecycle for me is getting challenged in current form. Yeah. I think the only thing I'll caveat, which I'd love to get your view on is some organizations, a lot of people within here won't be have that maturity in their infrastructure. So what's your recommendation for if we look at products, managers, AI engineers, all those sort of people, what's the recommendation for like that level, what they should be doing if their organization's not necessarily that yeah. mature yet so they can start getting on that journey? Well, I think it comes back to what problem are you trying to solve? Like mm -hmm. solve the problem that you've, that you've got. And if there are aspects of, you know, helping you apply existing patterns for product management and product development that AI can play a role in, and it's the problem that you've got right now, then go for it. Yep. I'm just saying, don't necessarily limit yourself to trying to solve a set of problems that may not exist anymore if you think differently. But when I first started working with um, LLMs, the, the focus of most of the work that we did was on building AI products. Yep. So using LLMs within applications and typically using the kind of flagship frontier models, that still exists, mm. but there is a, an approach that's emerging about AI being a horizontal enabling layer just for how stuff is done. As a senior leader in an organization, you have to start to think how you can federate the use of AI as that enabling layer. Well, like you say, like all technology, it's not static, right? You yep. can't just assume what you have and, and what's uh, available to you. I'll challenge you, right? If you had- I like being challenged. Right. Because I might not be right. <laughs> no, no, because I think, no, I was going to challenge to pull and cipher from that, right? Those like three top, because I'm hearing a few things that I don't want to summarize for you. Those three, if you're, even a leader, because you realmed into what leaders should yeah. be starting to look at and those elements. So today, if I'm watching this and I'm going, that's really interesting, but I don't even have an idea where to start. Yeah. What are those three things? Like, what are those three tips of start experimenting with it? Because I'll get your view and then I might add one or two from my point of view. So I'm going to say something uh, a little bit off the wall. Here. You like that? Okay. So within a single team, a single product team, everybody, I think, understands the principles that the people who make the decisions about how things should happen should be close to the problem, close to the customer, close to the solution. Often what happens is when you move up an organization, decisions start to get made without that context. So my slightly off the wall advice for what senior leaders should do in organizations is put aside two hours, sit with technical people and do some of this yourself and get direct exposure to the implications of AI on how people work, how software gets built, the necessity of having it as, as an enabling layer. Do a bit of knowledge transfer. Really difficult to connect the like boiler room and the boardroom in organizations. Mm. But one of the most effective ways I've seen of doing that is to share some of those concepts from down here with people up here and vice versa. You know, you can't make good decisions in a single product team unless you have an understanding of, of strategy. But if at this level you're thinking, how much money do we need to put aside for like a, an AI enabling layer? Well, you know, get some direct exposure to what that might mean.
No, I love it. Love it. So it's kind of how do you, well, connecting the leaders, right, to that kind of, Ethan Mollick talks yeah. about the kind of lab and the crowd and yeah. the um, yeah. leadership within yeah. your team. So yeah. it's like bringing them all, all of those three together. Yeah, because I think the problem I see, right, and when you chat to leaders is they're almost struggling to, they see their teams are experimenting with loads of pilots, but they're nece not necessarily, they're just building on the current process, yeah. but it's not looking to enhance yeah. that flow. For me, it's kind of, you know, that first point is actually have a look at what problem you're trying to solve, like within your teams. Like, what is that problem statement? Bring together members in your team so that you can work on rather than just, you know, your product managers going off on a silo, creating epics and all that sort of requirements and then feeding them through to your dev team and you then feed it through to your QA. Bring them all together, right, through those planning cycles. And the one thing I would add to that is that user stories have been through a bit of a cycle of iteration you know there's like mm. well we have to have like water watertight bdd style acceptance criteria and it became very waterfally and people started to talk about the backlog as a placeholder for a conversation which i think is really valid but you've just got to ask yourself who's the conversation between because mm. it's not just between people anymore yep. it's a conversation between people and people and their machine yeah and what's the best way of giving a machine clear direction and instructions and it's not necessarily backlog to leaders. I've loved having you kind of on and uh, Danny and I like work together right on some of these problems day to day anyway but it, what's your kind of 20 second 30 second close out they, there might be some people sat here going look this is really interesting I'd love to go learn more or there might be some people who are kind of going uh oh, my organization would never do this, but how do I even start on that journey? So I suppose, how can people educate themselves more about this topic? Yeah. Then also, how do people start to challenge it by showing? What's your advice? I think there's one fundamental thing that really is the foundation of the whole tech industry. The whole tech industry is not built on, like, we use these frameworks, or we use these tools, or we use these approaches. The whole tech industry and the why it's so globally dominant is built on a really simple premise, which is start with why. Start with the why. Well, there we go. Awesome. Um, well, thanks very much for listening. Um, as always, follow the newsletter. Uh, I'll put Danny's details as well within the YouTube link and the LinkedIn newsletter. And see you next time. Thanks. And feel free to disagree with me anyway. <laughs> well, there will be, I'm oh, sure, some disagreements.